The Middle Ages were a time of disease, grinding poverty, and religious corruption. Only a few Bibles were in existence. Most were in Latin, locked away in universities or monasteries. A flicker of flame was kept alive by the Waldenses, who painstakingly copied the scriptures by hand and carefully shared it with others on their missionary journeys. In spite of the Waldensians' efforts, the state church was still the most powerful political and religious force in Western Europe. Its persecution of dissenters and heretics forced the truth underground. Join us as we uncover the heroic lives of those who led out in this movement and changed the world forever. This is the story of Light Unshackled. It was during this dark hour that a man stepped onto the stage who would herald the coming morning. He arose from the edges of the Holy Roman Empire in the country of England. His name was John Wycliffe. As a young man, Wycliffe arrived at Oxford University to study theology. He quickly was recognized as a diligent scholar and deep thinker. While he was at Oxford, in the summer of 1348, the Black Death arrived in England. Hundreds of thousands of people died from this ravishing disease. Carts would rumble down the streets in the morning to pick up those who had died during the night. As church cemeteries filled up, many were thrown into mass graves and hastily buried. There was hardly a family to be found who had not lost a loved one to the plague. Wycliffe was deeply impacted by what he saw as he contemplated the dead and the dying. He, along with much of Europe, began to question the traditions of the church. As a professor at Oxford, he had access to the scriptures. He began spending more and more time reading them. And within its pages, he found answers and hope to the deep and painful questions surging through his mind. As England's social conditions were deteriorating, Friars and monks swarmed through the English countryside, begging for money and food. Though the monks had vows of poverty, the monasteries did not, and they became very, very wealthy. The gulf between the church and the people was growing. This infuriated Wycliffe. Having deeply studied the Bible and the teachings of the church, he found major discrepancies. He boldly began to preach and write against any unscriptural practice. He saw penance and indulgences as ways to manipulate people to donate money. He rejected the idea of confessing one's sins to a priest and that a man could forgive sins. Based on the Bible, he denounced many of the religious practices of the state church, including celibacy, the authority of the priest over God and the mass, idol worship, pilgrimages, the veneration of the saints, and prayers to and for the dead. When the church told the English monarch that he must pay a church tax, Wycliffe spoke to Parliament, arguing eloquently that such demand was not in harmony with the Bible. Wycliffe's influence convinced the king to refuse the financial demands of the Pope. In this, he had touched the church's source of money. Enraged that his influence is greater than their own, the church stirred up controversy against him and forced him out of Oxford. He withdrew to Lutterworth and pastored this rural congregation behind me. The church thought that this would decrease his influence, but he was about to release the greatest ally to the Reformation. Wycliffe translated the Bible from Latin into English. This was in direct opposition to Rome. The state church had a long history of suppressing the Bible. In 1199, Pope Innocent III stated that the Bible should not be in the language of the common person, for the unlearned would be unable to interpret it properly. The Council of Toulouse in 1229 condemned anyone who translated or owned a Bible. And just a few years later, in 1234, the Council of Tarragona decreed the following. 
no one may possess the books of the Old and New Testament in the common language. And if anyone possesses them, he must turn them over to the local bishop within eight days of this decree, so that they may be burned. Not only did Wycliffe translate the Bible into English, but he trained a group of lay pastors called Lollards. Fanning out across Europe, these men distributed thousands of handwritten copies of the Bible, as well as Wycliffe's writings. The church opposed his teachings and writings. Over his lifetime, Wycliffe was put on trial three separate times, but each time he was able to escape. During one trial, he gave a thundering response for his belief in God and the Bible is God's word, and then simply walked out. His accusers sat stunned. It was as if God's hand was over this brilliant scholar, protecting him from a martyr's grave. It was during this time that the Roman church was rocked by a major scandal that distracted its attention and protected Wycliffe. Three separate men claimed to be the sole pope of the church and proceeded to excommunicate the others in what is now called the Western Schism. They strongly denounced their opponents as being the Antichrist. Speaking of the Pope of Rome and the Pope of Avignon, France, Wycliffe said that they were two halves of Antichrist, making up the perfect man of sin between them. He encouraged people to look away from the men to the Word of God. He said even though there were a hundred popes, and though every mendicant monk was a cardinal, they would be entitled to confidence only in so far as they agree with the Bible. The Western Schism lasted almost 40 years and was finally resolved at the Council of Constance. The three popes were removed and another pope was elected to take their place. While the church was fighting, the truth of God was able to spread. As the dust settled, the state church began to focus on rooting out the Reformation movement. They found many in England had accepted Wycliffe's teachings. In fact, one papal delegate complained, you could not meet two persons on the street, but one of them was a Lollard. The Queen of England was herself a convert to Wycliffe's teachings and worked to protect him. During one of his trials, she sent word to the council forbidding them to pass sentence against him. She was a princess from Bohemia, and through her influence, the reformer's writings were widely circulated in her native country. Wycliffe has been called the morning star of the Reformation. Just before the sunrise, he was like a bright light in the darkened sky. Morning was dawning and light was beginning to spread. As the Lollards carried the scriptures far and wide across Europe, concepts from the Bible were being embraced by the people. The Bible had been translated into the Bohemian language, but over time, it was outlawed. In its place, ignorance and superstition took hold. But the rumblings of change could be heard in the distance. Jerome, a fiery preacher and professor from Bohemia, came to Oxford University in England to continue his studying. Well there, he came across some pamphlets by Wycliffe. While he read them, he became convinced that these were truth. Copying them down, he took them back with him to Bohemia and shared them with a professor by the name of Jan Hus. Hus was named after the town he was from, Hussinic, or Goose Town. His gentle and winning deportment earned him admiration from classmates and professors alike. He graduated in 1396 and was asked to become a faculty member of the university in Prague. Over the following years, Huss and Jerome became close friends. Their personalities complemented each other. Huss was thoughtful, wise, and discerning, while Jerome was passionate, charismatic, and a powerful speaker. Jerome encouraged Huss to study the writings of Wycliffe that he had brought back from England. Huss was intrigued and agreed with what he was reading. He found Wycliffe's teachings to be supported in scripture and believed the church would benefit from these rediscovered beliefs found in the Bible. 
In 1402, Huss was appointed rector of the Bethlehem Chapel in Prague. It was in this church that week after week, Huss preached not in Latin, but in the language of his members. Thousands came out to hear about a savior that loved them and cared about them personally. From his pulpit and from his classroom, light was shining and reaching much of Prague and Bohemia and converting them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The trouble was brewing at the University of Prague. Johann Hubner, a fellow professor, strongly challenged 45 points of Wycliffe's teachings including that the Bible was the only basis of authority for Christian doctrine. He was determined to have Wycliffe's writings declared heretical by the state church. Three years later, Pope Innocent VII ordered the Archbishop of Prague to suppress the reading, teaching, and studying of Wycliffe's writings. But Huss had seen the light of the Bible shining through the writings of Wycliffe and felt compelled to continue sharing them. By the time Huss was preaching the Reformed doctrines, just under 20 years had passed since Wycliffe's death. The church authorities in Bohemia appealed to the new pope, Alexander V. They were upset at Huss for criticizing the selling of indulgences to raise funds. He accused the church of acting out of selfish interest. It wasn't long before Rome responded. In 1412, Huss received a letter demanding that he travel to Rome to stand trial for his faith. He knew that if he went to Rome, it was certain torture and death. Not surprisingly, he refused to go. Enraged at his disobedience, the Pope issued the ultimate punishment. Huss was excommunicated. In the eyes of the church, he was now condemned to burn in hell for all eternity. To the medieval mind, this was to be dreaded more than anything else. But Huss's mind had been lit by the Word of God. How could a human authority condemn someone to burn in hell for obeying divine commands? The Bible was his only authority, and to it he would bow. Unafraid of a piece of paper, he continued to preach every single week. Thousands in the city of Prague followed his example and packed the chapel to hear the word of God for themselves. As the Bohemian people accepted and spread the newfound light, there was an awakening to the principles of grace and hope. The Waldenses continued pouring young missionaries from their valleys into Central Europe. The Lollards from England joined them in spreading the light. Rome was rapidly losing ground to the Reformation. In a desperate attempt to stop its advancement, it put the city of Prague under interdict. No one could marry, receive communion, or even be buried in the church cemetery until Jan Hus was removed as pastor in Prague. To protect the people, Hus left the city to continue preaching and writing from the countryside. As he was leaving, he clearly stated that he no longer trusted indecisive kings, hostile popes, or ineffective councils. He appealed directly to Jesus Christ as his judge and the scriptures as the foundation of his faith. Bypassing the structure and traditions of the medieval church, he argued that Christ alone is the head of the church and that a pope, through ignorance and love of money, can make many mistakes and that to follow the Bible, even if a pope demands otherwise, is to obey Christ. For the Bohemian Reformation, this step was monumental. Bohemia as a nation was accepting a new authority, the Bible. The state church realized that any attempt to force Huss to come to Rome would be futile. So, they pressured the Emperor of Bohemia to deal with the heresy. Huss was summoned to Constance, Germany, to answer the charges that had been leveled against him. Emperor Sigismund promised him the protection of a safe conduct, and his appearance was presented as an opportunity to dialogue and to share new light with the Emperor and his courts. But the dialogue was not to be. 
For the first few weeks in Constance, Huss was allowed his freedom. But on November 28, 1414, he was arrested and eventually thrown into the dungeon beneath the tower behind me. He was left to rot for months in this awful place. Emperor Sigismund thought to release him, but the Pope's representatives argued that the agreements with heretics were not binding and that Hush should be punished immediately for his apostasy. Sigismund wavered and Hus stayed in prison. When Jerome heard that Hus had been captured, he rushed to Constance without any guarantee of a safe conduct. He arrived in April of 1415 to the surprise of many, but he quickly realized there was nothing he could do to help his friend. He tried to escape back to Bohemia, but was captured along the route, brought back to Constance, and thrown into jail. The enemies of Hus wanted to have him executed without a trial, but powerful Bohemian princes pled for Hus to be given a hearing, and to this Sigismund finally relented. On June 8, 1415, Hus was summoned to appear before the court. As he stepped before the court here in the church, he was barely recognizable. After months in a dark, filthy dungeon, he was sick, gaunt, and physically and emotionally exhausted. One man, standing against the most powerful authorities in the kingdom. But this man stood on the authority of the Bible. The trial was a sham. Thirty articles were read against him. When he attempted to respond or correct different areas, he was told to be quiet. In the end, his options were to renounce his teachings and beliefs, or die at the stake. Hus protested his innocence, and to refuse to renounce anything until he was clearly shown from Scripture where he was wrong. As he attempted to speak, loud shouts echoed through the hall in an attempt to silence him. At this, Hus turned and looked directly at Sigismund. It was on his promise of a safe conduct that Huss had come. Sigismund's face turned a crimson red, and he turned away in shame. And so, Huss was condemned by the church authorities on July 6, 1415, and handed over to secular authorities to be burned. Realizing that he was about to die, Huss fell to his knees and prayed aloud, Lord Jesus Christ, I implore thee, Forgive all mine enemies for thy great mercy's sake. This used to be an open field, and where this rock is, is where the stake was set up. The Emperor's Marshal asked Huss one last time to recant. Huss refused. God is my witness, he responded, that the evidence against me is false. I have never thought nor preached except with the intention of winning men if possible, from their sins. Today, I will gladly die. His fate was sealed. Straw, wood, and kindling were piled up around his body, and pages from Wycliffe's handwritten Bible were torn out and used to start the flames. As the blistering fire licked at his body, he sang, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. He could be heard reciting the psalms until the flames silenced his voice. Finally, a godly man, whose only desire was to save souls, was gone. But Huss's enemies were not satisfied. They wanted his doctrines, his teachings, and his memory destroyed. The executioners scooped up his ashes and threw them into the Rhine River to prevent a burial site that could promote the fame of the reformer. But his ashes were carried to Switzerland, France, Germany, the Netherlands, and into the expanse of the North Sea. Little did Huss's enemies know that just as his ashes were carried to distant shores, so the truth he uncovered 
would spread throughout the world. The death of Huss deeply impacted Jerome, who is still rotting in prison. He had already suffered immensely, and the thought of burning alive terrified him. In fear, he renounced his beliefs and pledged to follow the doctrines of the state church. But his sufferings were far from over, and he was thrown back into prison. As he lay in his cell, his guilty conscience tortured him. How could he have denied his Lord? How could he have gone against the teachings he believed in? He was again brought before the council and urged to even more clearly renounce his beliefs. But Jerome had changed. Gone was his former cowardice. He said, You condemned Wycliffe and Jan Hus, not for having shaken the doctrines of the church, but simply because they exposed the scandals proceeding from the clergy their pomp, their pride, and all the vices of the prelates and the priests, the things which they have affirmed and which are irrefutable, I also affirm. The council was furious and condemned him to die. A year after the execution of Jan Hus, on May 30, 1416, Jerome was burned. As he stood there with his hands tied to the stake and kindling piled up around his legs, he was unflinching. Gone was his former cowardice as the executioner came up behind him to light the fire. Jerome said, come and kindle it before my eyes. If I was afraid of it, I would not have come to this place. As the flames looked up around him, his last words were, This soul in flames I offer. The enemies of the Reformation were gearing up to wipe the Bible and its followers off the map. Those in Bohemia received the news of Huss and Jerome's death with fear and consternation. Rumors swirled that Emperor Sigismund was amassing a vast army to once and for all deal with those from the state church called heretics. In 1420, Pope Martin V issued a papal bull calling for a crusade against the Wycliffeites, the Hussites, and all other heretics in Bohemia. The church promised wealth, adventure, and a guaranteed entrance to heaven for all those who fought alongside her. Fear gripped the heart of the people and they looked to God to raise up a deliverer. They did not have long to wait. God was already moving on a man. His name was Jan Zizka. As a military leader, there are few equals to Zizka. Brilliant, courageous, and humble. He is in a rare group of generals who never lost a battle. As he heard of a personal God who would forgive sins through faith in Jesus Christ, he was determined to give his life to him. When the forces gathered to eradicate the Reformation from Prague, Zizka stood ready to lead the small armies of Bohemia against the invaders. On June 30, 1420, Emperor Sigismund, with over 80,000 crusaders, arrived outside the walls of Prague. The Sea of Soldiers, like the fog of impending doom, spread out around the city. The citizens of Prague were terrified. They were greatly outnumbered, were not trained in war, and had few weapons. It appeared that the Reformation was about to be snuffed out. With intense earnestness, the town turned to the Lord for help. What happened next is incredible. Sigismund ordered his elite cavalry to take an outpost not far from the city of Prague. 3,000 of his cavalry marched across the river and made their way towards the outpost, which was guarded by 26 men, two women, and one small child. They were reduced to throwing stones and using sticks to keep the enemy at bay. 
it appeared that they were about to lose when one of the women, whose name has been lost to history, charged towards the enemy, shouting, no true Christian will retreat from Antichrist. This inspired the others. And this handful of people were able to hold the thousands at bay until Zizka could mobilize his reinforcements and come to their aid. But his reinforcements were badly outnumbered and ill-prepared to fight the elite cavalry. But they came, singing hymns, praying, and trusting in the power of God to deliver them. As they approached, the elite cavalry felt a supernatural terror come over them, and they fled from a choir. Throwing themselves off the cliff and drowning in the river before, they were completely routed by a choir singing hymns and praising God. Over the next 15 years of the Hussite Wars, General Zhishka led his army from victory to victory. Even after he lost sight in both of his eyes, he was able to envision the battlefield and guide his soldiers accordingly. His leadership protected the Reformation in its infancy. Zhishka and his generation eventually died, and the old guard was replaced with moderate leadership who were willing to compromise for the sake of peace and safety. The call for unity within the church was promoted as more important than following the teachings of Scripture. Eventually, the state church regained control, and light was shackled away from the people. Wycliffe, Huss, and Jerome passed, but their work of sharing the Bible with the common person had planted seeds of light. They had not formulated the principles of the Reformation, rather they discovered these principles by simply reading the Bible. As people followed the light, God blessed with even more light. Contained within the scriptures is the path to forgiveness and peace with God. It teaches that salvation is through Jesus Christ, not a church, and that it's free and personal without the need of a priest. This cut at the very foundation of the religious hierarchy. The church taught that for a short life of sin, God would condemn a person to burn in hell for all eternity. This put an emphasis on the need to purchase forgiveness, but created a vast chasm between God and man. As Huss stood before the council that condemned him to die, he said, Today you are going to burn a goose, but in a century you will have a swan, which you can neither roast nor boil. This he said referring to himself as the goose from Goose Town, but he also referred to the coming of a reformer, who the church would be unable to silence, whose hammer, thundering against the door of a church, would advance the Reformation with explosive power.